Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at Blue Bank Resort on Real Foot Lake. If you're looking for the best place on the lake for fishing, eagle watching, or enjoying some of the best catfish in the region, you'll find it at Real Foot Lake. Visit bluebankresort.com and reserve your cabin today. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, the podcast where every week we explore the people, the culture, and the history of our home right here in West Tennessee, just exactly like we do every single day at our museum and heritage park, Discovery Park of America. I'm your host, Scott Williams, and our special guest on this episode is Jason Kelly, who is an operations support manager who works at the Marshall Space Flight Center. Back me all the way up to the beginning. So you're you're from around here. From around here, yes. From South Fulton. I graduated from South Fulton in 2002. So I'm a, I'm a local native. Uh, my dad was actually a high school teacher at South Fulton and a football coach. So I had him in class and in football. So okay. So you played you played sports. Played sports too. Yeah, I'm kind of that oxymoron, the uh, the, the sports geek. Uh-huh. Uh, so, you know, it was very sporty, but also kind of in that geeky phase. So and what, what subject did your dad teach? Taught history. Okay. So I was well-rounded. <laughs> yeah. And how about your mom? Uh, my mom actually went back to school and got her teaching certificate in special education. So you, you are a, a, a product of teachers. Yes, of you could say that. Yeah, the education was big in the house. And you have siblings? I do have an older sister. Uh, she's about three years older than me. Okay. Uh, she lives uh, in uh, Lebanon, Tennessee. Okay. She's a physical therapist. So education and all that was was real big. So she was she got more of the smarts than I did. And and reading, I'm assuming they wanted you to read and encourage. Oh reading. yeah, yeah. Um, very much in reading. Very much in uh, doing doing the studies. I wasn't big in reading. Uh, <coughs> Telling my son, yeah, you got to learn to learn to enjoy reading now because later on, it's it's, it's all the time. And he's in here today too with us. We're excited <laughs> to have him as well. And so, were you were you interested in space or? Uh, um, of course, you know, as most kids, you know, being an astronaut and space stuff was kind of cool. Really got into that. Uh, but what really triggered me was uh, um, back in '92, I actually attended Kid College, and they had a mini space camp. Uh, Diane Bell was the instructor. And that's kind of what set me on this trajectory. And that kind of opened my eyes. And from that moment on, I was hooked. Wow. That's amazing. And of course, Diane Bell works with us here at yes. Discovery Park. And so you, um, when it was time to, to go to college, what, what were you looking for? So uh, looking at it, of course, engineering. I was looking uh, at aerospace engineering or some type of um, aeronautical engineering course. Uh, so... I uh, looked across the state and, of course, went to the University of Tennessee, started off in aerospace engineering. Uh, also, I was uh, I received a uh, Air Force ROTC scholarship. So that's right. where the Air Force detachment was. And I said, OK, that's that's where I'm going to go. And um, right off the bat, did you know exactly what you wanted to do or? Yes. Uh, so here here was my plan. And, of course, uh when you make a plan, something is going to change. Of course. <laughs> so uh, the the goal was uh, go to college, get an engineering degree, uh, go into the Air Force, become a pilot, and then try out for NASA. Uh, that, that was the plan. Uh, and then, of course, life kind of happened and changed it a little bit and just said, okay, I need to kind of refocus everything. And that's uh, I changed my major uh, to agricultural economics hmm. with a minor in biosystems engineering technology. And I did that because of the technology piece. Uh, how do you use uh, this new 21st century technology in the everyday life? And about what year? When was this? Uh, so that was uh, 2003, whenever I changed my freshman year. Okay. Uh, at the end of my freshman year, I kind of refocused everything and kind of said, okay, let's let's see where realistically where everything lies. And that was kind of the big change. And of course, technology continues to, to yes, very, very since, much so. since then. Yes. Um, and what ended up being your path? Did you have that in your mind as you started out, or no, no, I didn't. It was just uh, at first. Let me let me get into this technology area here. Um, I kind of looked. Yeah, I can use economics anywhere in a business setting, uh, but then also in technology, you got to understand the business and the technology side to kind of prosper in the industry. So I figured. Well, those two are together, so let's try that and then see where this goes. And and uh, what was your uh, first job after graduation? Uh, so luckily, uh, 
for me, the summer before I went down to uh, the U.S. Space and Rocket Center and was a counselor at Aviation Challenge. Okay. So I didn't have anything really lined up and said, well, if I'm going to go into the, the technology aerospace sector, Huntsville's the place to be. So I went back down to the U.S. Space and Rocket Center and went back to, uh, to space camp and became a counselor. And, then and tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, what what? Because a lot of our listeners won't know exactly what that is. Uh, so, uh, space camp is a standard one week camp where you basically train as an astronaut. You go through the simulators. You train for a mission, and then sometime during the week, you actually have a mission. Uh, when we were doing it, was uh, you launch in a, a simulator shuttle, and you go do a mission to repair a satellite or something like that, or build something. And then you come back. Uh, then there's missions to the space station that they were doing. So you kind of have these kind of great little uh, tangible pieces uh, to space camp. Uh, and then Aviation Challenge was the sister camp down there, which is more of a military style camp. It's more for the, the fighter pilot, survival training, um, special ops piece. So you can kind of get two different flavors there. One, if you want to do the space side and then another one, if you want to do the aviation side. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was really neat to kind of go down there and, and, and have, be a part of that. Well, it's cool that you, obviously the camps that you were part of when you were younger had such an impact. And so you, you got back involved and, yes. and gave back. Yes. Um, so uh, you were doing the camps, and, and, and what happened next? Um, so I was given the opportunity. Uh, there was a, a different department there at the Rocket Center uh, that's called the it was Geospatial Training and Application Center, GTAC for short. And what they were doing was is taking these technologies and showing them to different people and different agencies on how they could use them. And one of them was in agriculture, uh, where farmers could actually use this uh, system we had set up throughout the state with grant money, and they could actually use GPS on their tractors and things like that and figure out how could they uh, get better yields, how could they get more precise on you know, pesticides and stuff like the applications. How could they do, um, you know, when they do irrigation, how could they limit waste and then increase productivity, you know, and, and their costs, shrink it down, but also their profits raise. So that, that was a good area uh, for kind of jumping off into. Uh, but another area that they had was a new program uh, with the Alabama Homeland Security called Virtual Alabama. Uh, the reason that that project came up was the governor was looking at uh, disaster imagery from a hurricane. And he asked the state, hey, I can see the damage, but I don't know how much was damaged. He goes, I want to see before and after. And they kind of looked at it and I said, well, I don't know if we really got anything like that. Mm. So he kind of set forth with Homeland Security and he said, I want this to happen. Uh, so what, uh, what eventually happened was is we used a Google Earth platform. It was on our own servers behind our own firewalls. And we could control who had access. And it was built for first responders so they could have a, a 3D map of the areas. And they could look at before and after imagery of the areas real time. We could actually, within hours of getting the imagery, be able to turn it around, put it on it, publish it so people could see it and use it. Uh, for tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, search and rescue, uh, things like that. And then we started going into uh, with firefighters doing pre-planning. They can map out, do 3D maps. Law enforcement started using it for school safety. That's been a big thing here lately. They've actually got a, a big program going on now in the state of Alabama where they're using that type of technology to help out in case there are any issues. So that technology has now flourished in different areas oh, that I we never thought of. I can see where it, was, it would be crucial yes. to being able to have that document. Yes. I know there's some, there are some, some old you know, ways that you can find properties, yes. photograph from, uh -huh. you know, like from the 50s yes. and the 60s. And I've looked at like my grandparents' farm and things like that from, but I can totally see where it would be really crucial. It was. And that was kind of the, speaking of the property and stuff like that, we actually got our best imagery from the revenue office because every couple of years they would fly it mm. just to see, did you 
put a new pool in or yeah. a deck or an extension. <laughs> yeah. So they were looking at it for revenue purposes. Yeah. We were looking at it as, this is nice, high-resolution imagery that we can now use. Yeah. And we basically got the imagery for free and gave back so now other people could use. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So, really. so you did that at some point. Uh, when, when did you start to look towards NASA? Um, you know, I'd, I'd worked in there for for a couple of years and kind of said, you know, I'm sitting here in the Rocket City in Huntsville, Alabama, and, and said, hey, I really want to take a shot at this this NASA thing. And at that time, hiring was a little 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 troublesome, uh, but. Uh, eventually, I was able to uh, to get a job working on the ground system side uh, for NASA, and that's kind of eventually just how it happened for and me. It was just you applied for the job, applied just like and you applied would. and applied. Um, oh, you had to keep going back. Yeah, the the story I tell everybody is uh, the job that I finally got with NASA. I had applied three times, and on the third time, I finally got the interview. Oh, wow! And and you kept going. I back. kept going. Got to yeah. be persistent. What made you keep going back? Um, just that, that childhood dream inside me was, Hey, this is something I really want to do. I want to really want to pursue it. And it was just one of those, I couldn't, couldn't leave it on the back burner anymore. And so they called you to come in for the interview. What, what was that like? Oh, that, that was, that was really, uh, really neat being able to go, uh, the building that I went into, uh, is where I, I work, uh, has a lot of history to it. Um, and it's the, um, uh, called the Huntsville Operations Control Center, the HOSC, as we all call it. Of course, NASA, everything, there's an acronym. And sometimes an acronym inside of an acronym. Mm -hmm. uh, but went in there and actually got to kind of go around the facility. Mm -hmm. And I chalked it up at the end of the interview and said, even if I don't get the job, I at least got to go in the facility and get a behind-the-scenes look. Yeah, yeah. I've said that about <laughs> interviews before. Yes. And it's really neat just kind of sit there and say, hey, not many people – First, work here, and then two, not many people actually get to see this kind of stuff. So it was, it was really neat. And so how many interviews did you have to go through? Uh, luckily, one. So they okay. kind of shrunk down the pool. Uh -huh. And uh, I had the interview and kind of waited a little bit, a couple of weeks. And um, one of the guys that interviewed me, he was a friend of one of the guys uh, in my hometown. And they were kind of talking back and forth. And he kind of basically asked the guy, hey, what kind of guy is this? Because yeah. we really need somebody that's going to work. Yeah. And he's, he kind of spoke up and said, yeah. He goes, I know the guy. He, he'll, he'll put in the time and he'll work for you. And so what, what exactly was the job? Uh, so the group that I worked in, we had what we call it's a, a back room support center. So it was the Data Operations Control Center or DOKER. And the purpose of that is all the data that comes in from the, the International Space Station all travels through that facility. And we are in charge of the whole ground system. So once it hits the ground out at White Sands, New Mexico, we are now in charge of it. It's our responsibility. And when it gets to us, we store it. And we also send it out to the end users, the, the ones that have built these experiments, running them and to the scientists. So we have to make sure, if one, we get it, and two, we get it out there. And the other piece is communications. So uh, the great thing with the International Space Station is we allow some of the uh, science developers to actually talk to the astronauts uh, because it's complex and it's hard to do and trying to do secondhand information to them and instructions, it gets kind of tedious and hard. So we say, hey, you know the experiment. We'll just let you talk to them. So that communication link comes through us too. So we, we were in charge of that whole system. And at first, you kind of look at it, and it's very daunting. Uh, then after a while, I basically, my instructor told me, just think of it as, as plumbing. <laughs> you got the gozentas and the gozaltas. Yeah. That's all you got to know. <laughs> <laughs> and so how long, how long um, is that? You've, you've, how long have you been there? Uh, so uh, in April will be six years total. And how has it changed? How has it evolved what you do there? Uh, so I've, I've jumped around a little bit. Uh, so I did the, the work in the Doker for about two years, two and a half years, uh, working in that. Uh, one of the cool things is uh, we were starting new um, technologies on how do you deliver 
uh, information to and from for long distance. Mm -hmm. uh, so the networking, the space networking uh, had actually started up when I got there. It was kind of a concept and now we're actually testing pieces and, and flourishing with that idea. So when we do go to the moon and go to the Mars, we've now had test beds and that technology has proven out and it's really cool to be part of that piece of it. Uh, the other uh, area, uh, uh, while I was working on the ground system side, I was asked to uh, lead the team for the development and the implementation of a brand new uh, flight control position called Marshall Ground Control. Mm -hmm. And uh, that one was very daunting. Um, I worked on that project just to get it up and operational about a year and a half. And that was literally figuring out what the concept was, how we were going to operate, the procedures we were using, creating procedures, creating training, going through all this and scoping things out. Uh, and then I was able to uh, actually become the first Marshall GC to certify and, and then operate the console. Mm. So we went live in uh, April of 2017. And it was it was a little different from the, the previous position just because you're more up front and visible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any interests, anything new on the horizon for you there? or? Uh, so currently I work as an operations support manager. Uh, what we do is uh, we basically are the right-hand person to the payload ops director. Mm -hmm. So in the payload operations control center, you have to have a leader. In that room, we have the pod. And they are like our equivalent to a flight director in mission control. So they are our operations director in our mission control at Marshall. Uh, so luckily for me, uh, with that, I have uh, a lot of... Um, a lot of training and expertise uh, being an OSM and being backing up the, the pods that they are now kind of starting to transition for training in that pod position. So as things go, they're now looking at beefing up the, the, the pallet ops director slot. So they are kind of saying, can we, can we train certain people? Yeah. So that's kind of going back into the, the control center there. That's great. So, yeah. What, what do you think? I mean, you're right there in the heartbeat. What, what is the future of NASA? Like what, what, uh, what, what, what is the next 10 years going to look like? Uh, so uh, here, hopefully this year, it looks like everything's lining up where commercial crew is now the, the big, big thing. That's supposed to happen this year, right? Yeah. The, you know, the, the, the flights and stuff, they're, they're tweaking things and making sure they got everything right. Uh, so hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, uh, commercial crew uh, becomes the, the new way that, w that we operate. Um, the space station, International Space Station, has been a huge success. Uh, looking at it, uh, we are now uh, starting our celebration for 20 years of operation mm. of the, the ISS. So with that, uh, we're looking at, well, can we get another 10 years out of this thing? Yeah. Uh, so things are kind of starting to work in those areas. Uh, but with that, commercializing space, how do you do that? How do you facilitate that? Uh, there's a, there's been a lot of conversations, a lot of things that are starting to move to make that happen. Uh, so I think uh, commercialization is is a really big thing. Uh, then also uh, the moon. I mean, 2024, we've been mandated to to put boots on the ground on the moon and stay there, and then use that as a training platform to go to Mars. So hopefully, uh, in you know 10 years, we've got a, a nice big moon base set up operating people living there we've got uh, the lunar gateway supporting people and uh, then getting everything ready to go to mars i think that's kind of the next thing going that could happen in my lifetime if, if i live if i live good and everything goes well yeah. it'd be crazy to see that wouldn't it? crazy to see yeah i know it, it's amazing it you know everybody looks at it in these movies and stuff and you know right around the right around the corner that could possibly happen well, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Yes, thank you for having and, me and and uh, checking out Discovery Park and and uh, talking to folks tomorrow. I know you're going to be uh, talking to some classes yes. and doing some educating, which will be cool. So we really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And like I said, you, this is my my first time here, and you know, from what I've seen, just kind of walking through the doors, it's really really nice place, and uh, it's wonderful to be invited. And uh, hopefully everybody enjoys the talks and enjoys the exhibits. And uh, like I said, thanks for having me. You bet. And now let's go find out a little bit more 
behind the scenes at Discovery Park of America. All right, thank you, Scott. I'm Andrew Gibson with the Education Department here at beautiful Discovery Park of America. And today I'm with Zach Ray, an education specialist here, who will be sharing a story uh, about some local history. Uh, So, Zach, take it away. All right, well, what I'm going to be talking about with local history is the Sultana Explosion. This was prevalent to this area because the Battle of Union City. Uh, A lot of the soldiers who were uh, stationed here after that battle were sent to Andersonville. At the end of the Civil War, they were let go. They were put on steamboats to take them back home, take them up north, and they would travel by the Mississippi River. What ended up happening is the Sultana was actually overloaded to the point where I believe it could only hold, I want to say, like, let's say 500 people. We're looking at 2,000 or more people on this. That might be a slight exaggeration, but it is not by much. Uh, Let's put it to you this way. The numbers of the people who died actually was more than the sinking of the Titanic. And then that can take you into a concept. It's like, wow, that's actually quite a bit more. And it's just right down right down the road from where, where we are. What ended up happening is it was overpacked and the boiler system on it, the Sultana's boilers were actually, one of them was actually cracked and needed to be repaired. And the captain ended up not wanting to repair it and what ended up happening is he takes the money and just basically puts a band-aid over what ends up happening or what ended up happening to the boiler and said all right we'll fix it when we get to our next stop their next stop was actually memphis and what ended up happening is the overloaded crew or the overloaded capacity of the ship was causing its rock severely One theory is that uh, this rocking caused the boilers to become overheated, um, causing the water to flash into um, steam and cause the boilers to fail and to explode. Now, I say this because the boilers were ended up being so close to the people, like where the room was, that they were jettisoned straight off the the boat. A lot of them died instantly. Um, the interesting thing about this, I guess I could, you can end on a, uh, not necessarily a positive note, but a better note is that we just fought a war where it was brother against brother, father against, uh, son and people in Memphis, Confederates even went out and rescued the people off this explosion and drug them to safety and a lot. And there is actually a memorial to this explosion on what this ended up happening. Zach, thank you for sharing that story with us. Uh, if any of you are, are interested in local history and want to want to dive into more, um, you can come to Discovery Park of America and learn more about the history of West Tennessee, the Civil War, and the Battle of Union City even. Uh, so guys, thank you so much for listening. Zach, thank you so much for coming on air. We hope to see you here at Discovery Park of America real soon. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.